My name is Susan Shaw and I have the privilege of taking over from uh, Marlene as the next board chair of Saskatchewan's Health Quality Council. I'm also an anesthesiologist and critical care doctor in Saskatoon. I spend most of my time at the bedside, but I'm incredibly privileged to be able to go back and forth between the high levels of policy and planning and the bedside and the patient and the family, which is where my passion is. <coughs> Excuse me. So my, uh, I was asked to talk about how can digital health improve the quality of care. And of course it can. Um, but the question is how, <laughs> and that's the hard part. And I want to take us, actually, I'm going to talk more about um, the, some of the basics that I think need to be in place. And I think they will match nicely with what Mr. Price has said, what Ms., uh, Dr. Seidman has said, um, what Dr. Flemings has said, and the previous panelists. I'm hoping it all comes together. Uh, I am from Saskatchewan, and that's a map of our large uh, province cut up into 13 health authorities. Patients don't care about those lines. Those lines are artificial, just as the uh, rectangular, simple structure of Saskatchewan is. It's completely artificial. Patients travel across these lines all the time. Their health information doesn't. Um, where we came from, when I, some of the topics I'm going to talk about today, is a commission uh, that was done by our government in 2008 called the Patient First Review. And it was a year-long process where patients were asked through uh, uh, online surveys, direct um, conversations, a whole variety of ways of finding out what is it that patients truly want, what do they experience, and what do they uh, value. They value respect, they res value dignity, they want us to have the information that follows them as they experience their health care, and they wanted better access to surgery. So out of that came the Surgical Initiative, a four-year-long uh, province-wide transformation project that is closing on March 31st, 2014, so just six short weeks from now, or five, I guess it's counting down quickly. But we went, we went differently on this. We didn't say it's just about access and doing more of the same. It's really about being sooner, but also safer and smarter. To be able to do that, we needed to be able to measure and to be able to analyze and report, and that's what Health Quality Council does a lot of. And I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges of doing that. So these are our surgical wait times. Uh, we are not gonna meet, and the minister's already said this, so I'm not uh, um, telling tales here. We will not meet our target that all patients within the province meet the, the, the goal, which was that they would have the option of surgery within three months no matter what, from decision to have surgery to time of operation. That's very different from the wait to see a specialist, the wait for diagnostics, the wait for communication, the wait for, for all the other waits involved. But that was our goal. We're very good at counting this. This is the surgical wait time. We can count how long you waited. Our CEOs actually got this every Monday. How many people are waiting? How many are waiting? How many are waiting? It was a high-pressure accountability um, target for them that they had to be able to meet. And we could count this very well. It took a little while to figure out who was actually on the list and off the list. But we were good at this. This was easy. This should be easy, too. This is a graph that describes one surgery, septoplasty, so you've got a deviated septum and you snore or you don't breathe or you don't feel well. Um, there's a a surgical treatment where they straighten things up on the inside, septoplasty. This describes how many septoplasties per thousand people are done per year based on where that person lives, where the patient lives. And it goes from south to north as you go across the screen from left to right. If we all did things the same way, it should be a fairly flat bar graph. It should be very little variation. But what we see here is that if you live in the southern half of our province, you have a very low rate compared to if you live at the north. So the big bar in the middle is Saskatoon, where I am, and we happen to have a lot of surgeons that do septoplasty. But the rate should be the same. It shouldn't matter where the surgeon is. It should matter where the patient is. So. It was actually really hard to make this graph. This was multiple iterations of data for just one simple surgery. And if we can't describe the variation that exists, how are we gonna understand why the variation exists? And are our patients in the South underserved and suffering with less access? Or are our patients in the North overserved, having procedures that are not adding value or improving outcome? I have no idea. You can't tell me. 
not you, <laughs> you, the system, cannot tell the surgeon what, what the results are here. This should be easy, but it's not, because we don't have the informatics, the, the, the automatic information coming in, being anal analyzed, and being reported back to patients. So why is that? Well, we have a, mismatch of, a mishmash of systems across that count. We have multiple registries, multiple databases bases, multiple MOUs, multiple privacy agreements, multi we can't even decide what one disease is called. These are all terms that could be the same thing or could not be the same thing. Whether you're a nurse, a, a pharmacist, a physician, whether you're young in your practice or you're near the end of retirement, your EMR might use all these different terms to describe just diabetes type 2. That's one of our biggest chronic diseases, and we can't even decide what it's called in a database so that CI, like CI8 uh, Kaihai can pull it out and report on it from your EMRs. And so that's a problem. So we don't have infrastructure that, we have lots of infrastructure, but we don't have information that's actually analyzable and reportable and actionable. So what do we need? And I think those are the things we need. We need data that's anal uh, real-time analytics and reportable. But you, you might want to know, it might, sorry, it might depend on who you ask when you ask, what is it that we need? Maybe a patient needs something else than the provider or the clinician, or maybe the policy person needs to know something else, or maybe it's actually all the same. I have a feeling it's closer than we, we, we think, and I have a feeling we've probably started at the wrong side of this um, this hierarchy, I put the patient at the, fur, at the top. I think our infrastructures right now probably are more designed to answer the needs of our payers or our government agencies or our health authorities or a physician practice rather than what it is a patient actually needs when they come. So what do we know? And you've heard some of this before. Patients want their information. There's lots of studies, surveys that report that patients want their information, that they deserve their information. It is their information. But we also know that patients need their information because they provide better self-care with a higher level of engagement and better outcomes if they're given access and control of their own pro <coughs> excuse me, problems. Patients also want their care providers to have all the information that care providers need to provide continu continuity of care, and they are stunned that we don't. I work in an intensive care unit, which is the ultimate failure of primary care. Primary care is where everything should be in my, in my, my world, but because it fails, or because the system fails, I have a job. Um, but my families are just stunned that their, their, their loved one's family doctor isn't a part of the team doesn't know, doesn't have access to results, doesn't get the reports until after discharge, until after it's too late. So that they want this, we don't provide it. Providers want to know, and this is me speaking as a physician, I want to know what I'm doing, but I also want to know, not just in quantity, how many surgeries I was a part of, but I also want to know, am I creating the best possible outcome for my patient? I happen to think I'm the best anesthesiologist in the province. I can't prove that to you, you can't prove me wrong. There's no doubt. I might be the worst, but I don't know that because you can't tell me, you being the system that doesn't exist, whether my length of stays are high, my nausea and vomiting rates are high, whether my patients are happy, whether my patients understood the care that they were receiving, whether they would do it again, um, whether I'm cost effective, whether I have excess nerve injuries, deaths. There's nothing. So I probably am the best in the province because that's the, what I believe. Um, now, if you're a policymaker, you want to be able to understand how is the system performing, what is the highest value, meaning highest quality possible at the lowest necessary cost, and what levers can I pull, what incentives can I align to make that happen. I think all that information is actually the same um, core, core data. So there are tools that make life easier. These are simple machines of six basic things you might learn in high school or university. But these are the core elements. There are core elements out there for data. I'm not the IT person in the room. I don't know what they are. But I do believe it's um, having some common standards and some interconnection of, uh, of uh, our, our system. So back to the basics, I'll say it again. Um, patient needs to absolutely be at the center of everything we do. Patients should be driving us rather than being the other way around. And patients need access. We need our data to connect patients across the patient's care journey. And that's not including the artificial geography of the practice in which you happen to have your provider, or the health region in which you happen to have your surgery, or the province in which you happen to live. 
It needs to be real time and reliable, and ideally with ongoing analysis, feeding back to me the quality of care I'm providing so I can course correct. Data without analysis and action is absolutely waste. We're big in Saskatchewan identifying waste and trying to drive it out. We have so much data that's not analyzed and acted on, and if it's not, I'd say why collect it? On top of that, we need to have good enough to go as one of our core principles. Good enough to go means it's not data for perfection, it's data to understand the signals so that we can move rather than sitting around and admiring the problems. This is one of our key um, core beliefs in the province right now. Stop admiring the problem and fix it. And I think we tend to do that with data. We um, want it to be perfect before it's released. We're scared. What if they find a mistake? What if it's not quite true? So I think we have to be, uh, or what if they actually read the report? Um, so we have to be a bit more, I think, brave with putting, putting you know, just moving on. Because in the meantime, if we don't do it, our patients are going to find workarounds. This is Heather. Heather's a good friend of mine. I met her as a resident. She is a ICU frequent flyer with two chronic diseases, uh, multiple allergies, and multiple near-death experiences. Um, and the binder is her artificial uh, paper health record that she's collected so that when she can't speak for herself, we have a book. So last year, she took, turned it into a memory stick. This is her workaround. Everything, she seeks it out, though. She goes to her family doctor, her internist, her allergist, her pulmonologist, her RT, or you can imagine, and she demands and pulls and scans and carries this around her so that when she gets sepsis in uh, St. Catharines, which is the last time she got sick when she was going on a speaking event, her husband gave them the memory stick so they could see everything. I think it's kind of sad that she has to do that. I think it's m remarkable that she did. Um, but I think that's our failure. That's something we own. This is a painting by Regina Holiday, and Dr. Seidman mentioned her, and I'm glad that uh, he did. She's a remarkable woman. And give me my own damn data is one of her mantras, along with you, patient Dave. This is a painting that she, uh, uh, was, she's, she, she speaks through art, as uh, uh, Joshua said. And this painting uh, is to hopefully inspire us that if we give the data to the people, the things that they can do, if we can move the barriers, and that's what I'd like to leave on, because I think if this is what I think uh, health IT does for us, or virtual health, or digital health, or EMRs, EHRs, all this stuff, it, it frees up possibility, and it's us that are in the way, and we have to get out of the way so our patients can do the things that they need us to do. Thank you. <laughs>